Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone, both of you who are here and those of us who are joining us online. It's my great pleasure to welcome to Microsoft Research Shima Advadi. Um, Shima completed her PhD in 2013 at the University of Michigan in the field of blind deconvolution. And now she works jointly, uh, partially as a research scientist at Columbia University and partially at the University of Washington in the School of Oceanography. And she will be presenting today her talk entitled Blind Deconvolution Using Unconventional Beamforming. And without further ado, Shima, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about blind deconvolution using unconventional beamforming. In my PhD, I worked on array signal processing. Specifically, I worked on blind deconvolution, and I developed a new beamforming technique. I applied these two techniques to underwater communication, marine mammal localization, and biomedical imaging. But I also believe that these techniques can be used in audio processing in devices, for example, like Kinect. I will start my talk with an introduction to acoustic signal processing task, blind deconvolution and its application, and then I talk about synthetic time reversal, which is a blind deconvolution technique. Then I talk about the mathematical formulation of synthetic time reversal, plane wave beamforming, and my new beamforming technique, frequency difference beamforming. Then I will show you some results and I, uh, discuss conclusions and future work at the end. Uh, acoustic signal processing has three main tasks. The first one is signal detection. By signal detection, I mean finding a specific signal among a lot of sound sources. A good example of signal detection happened recently. Uh, it was the search for the black box of Flight 370, uh, which was lost in the ocean. Uh, there are so many sound sources underwater. We have ship noise, seismic activities like earthquake. We have sound from school of fish, from marine mammal. But among all these sound sources, we wanted to find a black box. And so we were looking for a specific frequency and bandwidth that comes from the black box. The second task is localization and tracking, which has two subcategories. If we want to know the direction of acoustic energy, we need to beamform the signal. Beamforming is a powerful signal processing technique for spatial filtering. We also can use a localization technique to find a location in two-dimensional or three-dimensional. A good example of localization is echolocation. For example, bats use um, ultrasound signal, record the reflected signal, and uh, by localization technique, they uh, navigate and find their prey. In animal biology, uh, we can use a localization uh, technique to study the migration pa pattern of uh, marine mammals. Or in electronic devices like Kinect, we use beamforming technique to find the arrival angle. The third task is identification. And identification means recovering the actual source signal. For example, in room acoustic, when we say hello, in, at the receiver location, we may hear a distorted signal. By identification techniques, we want to recover the actual source signal from the distorted signal. Blind deconvolution is an identification technique. We use blind deconvolution for recovering the source signal. Or um, identification is some, sometimes called, in some cases, echo cancellation too. In blind deconvolution, we have a sound source, which is unknown. It broadcasts a signal and uh, propagates through an unknown environment. And we receive signal by a single receiver or an array of receivers. Blind deconvolution uses the received signal to go back and recover the source signal. Synthetic time reversal is a blind deconvolution technique. We use synthetic time reversal for recovering the source signal. 
But before talking about synthetic time reversal, I want to talk about time reversal itself. Time reversal is a technique for focusing waves, and it's based on a feature of wave propagation called reciprocity. Let's say we send a delta function at point A. What we get at point B is going to be the direct path and all the reflections from the wall and hard surfaces in the room. Now, if we reverse this signal in time and broadcast it from point B, what we get at point A is the delta function. So this is the main idea of time reversal. Synthetic time reversal gets the main idea, but we do not need to be able to broadcast from point B. The broadcasting part is doing synthetically. The advantage of time reversal technique is we do not need to know any information about the environment as long as it's not changing. Now let me talk about synthetic time reversal. In synthetic time reversal, we need to know the location of receivers, and we need to have the received signals. These are the inputs. And we, get, we can recover the source signal and all the impulse responses. As I told you, synthetic time reversal is a fully passive technique. We do not need to broadcast. We just listen. And it's very efficient. There is no searches or optimizations or iterations. Now let me talk about the mathematical formulation of synthetic time reversal. But before, I want to define some notations here. I show source signal by S, transfer function by G, received signal by P, and J is the receiver index from 1 to N. N is the number of receivers that I have. As you know, the, transfer function, uh, the received signal is a convolution of transfer function and source signal. In frequency domain, we have a simple multiplication like that. We have the received signal. We want to find the source signal when the transfer function is unknown. So this is the main problem. Now, if we write the received signal like this, which is the norm, it has been divided by the summation of the magnitude the square of all the receiver signal, the, source, the magnitude of source will be canceled from the, from the top and bottom. So what we have here is an estimate of transfer function plus an extra phase, which is the phase of the source signal. We can measure this part, so we have the left-hand side. From the right-hand side, if we can remove the source phase, we will, have a, we, have, we will have an estimate of transfer function. So we need a phase correction. The phase correction here uh, is uh, shown here. W is the weight function, P is the received signal. We multiply these two together and we sum over the number of receivers. And then we take the phase of this summation. If we choose the correct weight function, this phase is going to be source phase plus a linear function in frequency. Now, so the critical point is how to choose the weight function. In synthetic time reversal, the weight function is the weight function of plane wave beam forming. Here in this formula, you are familiar with that. D is the distance between each two receivers, C is the speed of sound, and theta sub L is uh, the arrival angle. Now, if we choose this W, put it here, we will get this as the output for alpha. And if we multiply, we take the, we multiply e to minus i alpha from the normalized uh, received signal, we will have an estimate of green function plus an extra phase, which is linear in frequency. Now, if we take the inverse Fourier transform, it will be, trans uh, it will be an estimate of transfer function with a time shift b which is the travel time along the path that we chose from the beam forming output. Now that we have the transfer function, we can use back propagation or inverse filtering to recover the source signal. Again, when we take the inverse Fourier transform, the source waveform is going to have a time shift B. OK, now we know how synthetic time reversal works. Let me show you a simple simulation, a uh, simple experimental result. In this experiment, I have a source here, 
and I send a very short signal at 2 kilohertz. Down here, I have an array of receivers, eight microphones. This is a sample received signal. You can see all the echoes after the uh, direct path. And the correlation between this signal and the actual source signal is only, only 59%. Now I use synthetic time reversal. I get this signal, which has 95% correlation with the actual source signal. So I was able, able to remove all the echoes and get back to the source signal. But in this case, beamforming was working, and I was able to use the beamforming output for the phase correction. Well, how about the phases, how about the cases that beamforming does not work? In the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about beamforming. Let me just uh, briefly talk about plane wave beamforming. You all know about that. This is a um, di diagram of plane wave beamforming. We have N receivers, so we have N received signal. We take the Fourier transform of these signals, we get the uh, P as a function of frequency, and we multiply each signal by an appropriate time shift, tau, which is uh, exactly like what we had in the, in the previous slides. So when we multiply the time shift, at the end we sum them up, we take the magnitude of the square, it's going to be our beamforming output. Here, in plane wave beamforming, beamforming output is a linear function of all the signals. We just have P here. Uh, now let me show you a simple simulation result when we have a free, free space, just one source and end receivers, no boundaries. Um, we have 16 receivers and the frequency that we send is very broadband from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz, which is almost the same as the hear human hearing range. Now we beamform that, it's going to be like this. This is the LOFAR gram and it's usually, uh, we have theta, which is a steering angle on y-axis from plus 90 to minus 90. Uh, it's usually versus frequency, but here I'm showing versus d over lambda. d is the distance between each two receivers, and lambda is the wavelength. We know that from signal processing, side lobes will be present when d over lambda is greater than half. So when we are down here, let's look at the marginal case, when d over lambda is equal half. We get a nice peak in the middle, so the results are good. We are getting what we want. But what if, if we go to higher d over lambda, like 1.5 kilohertz? We get a nice peak in the middle, which is, for the, which is coming from the source, but we get a lot of side lobes. Now, if we go to even higher frequencies, even higher d over lambda ratio, like here, which d over lambda is 40, which means the array is too sparse. The beamforming output is too noisy and it's confused. We can't resolve the angle. So the problem is here. But why it's not working here? We assume that all the receivers are receiving plane waves. However, when d over lambda is very large, which means d is very greater than lambda, the wavelength then we are not receiving plane wave anymore. We are, the receivers are feeling the curvature of wave bands. So that's why the plane wave beamforming uh, is not working. Now I want to add two reflections to the previous simulation. One reflection from positive angle 2.6 degree and one from negative angle minus 2.4 degree. And we have the same receiver, receiving array. For resolving these angles, we need at least one degree resolution in beamforming. So based on this calculation, which is the resolution, we need to manufacture somehow 1.5 kilohertz information to have at least one degree resolution. Let's look at the LOFAR gram of plane wave beamforming. It has the same setting as the previous slide. So if we look at the d over lambda over ha equal half, we get a nice fat beam in the middle. It's not able to resolve three angles because we don't have enough resolution at this frequency. For having higher resolution, we need to go to higher frequency. So let's go to 1.5 kilohertz that we expect to be able to resolve the angles. So you can see in the middle, we have three peaks at right 
uh, angles, but we also get side lobes. Now if we go to very, very large Z over lambda, again, plane wave beam forming is too noisy and featureless. So what if we only have the information here in very large D over lambdas? How can we resolve the arrival angles from beam forming outward? What should we do? Here, even the average beam forming is not working at all. If, if you have a broadband, if you take the average over frequency, it's not helping. So now I want to talk about the new beam forming technique for resolving this problem. The idea is very simple. P, which was the received signal, if I have that at omega 2, one, of, one frequency in the bandwidth, in the phase I will have one minus i omega 2 times t. Now if I take P at another omega, omega 1, but this time complex conjugate, in the phase I will have plus i omega 1 times t. Now if I multiply these two together, in the phase I will get the frequency difference times time. Remember that omega 1 and omega 2 are in the bandwidth, so they are, in high, they are very high frequencies, but the difference can be small. Now, instead of being forming P, if I beam form this product at omega 2 minus omega 1, I'm, I'm manufacturing the in lower frequency information. So, this is the new beamforming technique. It's called frequency difference beamforming. Now let's look at the diagram of this uh, technique. You've seen this before for plane wave beamforming. I just want to show you the different part, which is inside the red box. Instead of beamforming P, I'm beamforming the product, P times P conjugate, at two different frequencies. And instead of beamforming at omega, I'm beamforming at delta omega. Everything else is the same as plane wave beamforming. I sum them up, take the magnitude of the square, that's going to be the beamforming output. But this time, beamforming is a quadratic function of received signal, not linear anymore. Now let's uh, look at the beamforming output for the three path simulations, simulation that I had before. Uh, remember that Omega two, we can play with omega 1 and omega 2 to get different delta f, right? But the minimum delta f that I can get is a function of the sampling rate and the size of FFT. In this case, the minimum is 12.2 hertz. This is the low far gram of frequency difference beam forming at 12.2 hertz. We get a fat beam in the middle. We don't have enough resolution to resolve three angles. Exactly like plane wave beam forming, if you want to get Better resolution, I need to go to higher frequency. So let's go to 48.8 hertz. You see that the beam in the middle is getting narrower, but it's still not enough resolution, so let's go to higher. The beam in the middle is getting even narrower, but we are getting the side lobes. These are the uh, cross lines related to the side lobe. Remember that P has three uh, terms for each arrival. When we multiply P by P conjugate, we get nine terms. But we only want three terms, like the, the three terms that we want are in the middle. The other six terms are the cross lines here. So it's still not enough resolution. Let's go to higher frequency. We can, get, we can see the separation of path in the middle and more side lobes. But let's go to 1.5 kilohertz that we expect to get enough resolution for resolving three angles. This is the low far gamma at 1.5 kilohertz. It doesn't seem to be working, but I want to do a magic here. Let's rotate this figure by 90 degree. You see the three paths here, right? So we can get, we can keep the persistent part at the right angles by taking the average over frequency. Now let's look at the output. This is the average frequency difference and plane wave beam forming output. The dashed line is for plane wave output, which is featureless. The solid line is for frequency difference beam forming. We get three peaks at right angles. Now I want to um, show you the average beam forming output for different delta f. Delta f is increasing from bottom to the top. 
I want to show you some similarities between frequency difference beam forming and plane wave beam forming. When we, have, when we are in low frequency, we don't have enough resolution to resolve free angles. But as we go to higher frequencies, we are getting more resolutions, and you can see that. It's very similar to plane wave beam forming. The other thing that I want to show you is uh, the side lobes. For example, at 20 degree, we will get side lobes at this frequency if you do the calculation at 1170 hertz. Look at the 20 degree beam forming output. Here we don't have any side lobes, and we don't have still any side lobes, but at 1172 hertz we are getting the side lobes. So although the uh, frequency difference beam forming is a nonlinear technique, there are some similarities with the linear technique. Uh, no, sure. Um, with a super heterodyne radio receiver, um, typically you have a very large um, bandwidth, and inside there there is some signal that you, you want to recover, and you expect that for the majority of the radio spectrum there's not very much information, and in a very small bandwidth there is that information you want. Okay. And it's often not, um, not um, feasible to work at those frequencies directly. So instead you use an intermediate frequency whereby you introduce a, a mixer and that effectively shifts the spectrum down to some intermediate frequency. It may not be baseband, but maybe something else. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively a frequency difference kind of problem. You're, you're introducing uh, another mod kind of modulation that, that shifts your, your frequency of interest. Yeah. And on that you can then apply beamforming techniques or phase array techniques um, that, that, are, uh, that are already well in existence. I'm I'm not sure I understand the difference between doing that and what you're doing here. They seem to be the same thing. Well, uh, I guess in that case you are shifting the linear term of signal to the lower frequency, right? You are not making it non-linear. You don't have the product, right? There's a quadratic in there. There's a product where you're multiplying okay. by a local oscillator. Okay. And so that then becomes quadratic. Well, yeah. As this is actually a good point, and it has uh, been mentioned before, but I didn't compare that with the frequency difference beam forming yet. So I'm not sure if I can answer it correctly right now because I don't have uh, enough information about the technique. But maybe we can discuss that later. Sure. Yeah, sure. I ask a question to make sure I understand. Um, so these delta Fs, these are the difference in frequency between the basically sub-bands in each channel that you're multiplying between? Yes, these are basically the omega-2 minus omega-1 that I showed in the previous okay. slides. Yeah. So for example, for 1500 hertz, you're taking something at, say, 20 hertz, and you're, correlate, you're multiplying that with something at 1520 hertz. Exactly, that's okay. good. So actually, maybe, it, maybe, so it's interesting that you're demodulating kind of one sub-band by another sub-band. Mm -hmm. That could maybe the difference between using like an LO, which is a set frequency, hmm. and uh, and I mean you're you're just you're doing something a little different here because you're using like the other subbands as LOs for other subbands. Maybe that could be a difference. Yeah. Um, in a synchronous, I mean, I don't know this very well, but in a synchronous receiver, you you use its own carrier to demodulate itself, hmm. Hmm. and that oh, is very true. similar. So you, I can see that. It's, it feels like there are some similarities there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, so now that uh, we have a beamforming technique which works, uh, I want to apply the beamforming output to synthetic time reversal to recover the source signal. But this time, you remember we had this weight function for uh, the original synthetic time reversal, which comes from the plane wave beamforming. For this case, I need to change the weight function to use the nonlinear weight function, which depends uh, on the received signal itself. And if I do this change and apply synthetic time reversal, I can recover the source signal. This is the original source signal that I sent. It's a, uh, I guess, 50, 60 millisecond chirp. And this is one of the received signal. It has only 57% correlation with this one. You can see the distortion. Now if I use this weight function, apply synthetic time reversal, I can recover the source signal. Now I have 98% correlation with the actual source signal. 
Okay, now we know that it's working in simulation. Let's look at the experimental data. The experimental data that I used was for underwater communication signal. And I had the exact same receiver array. I had 16 channel with the same distancing, uh, element distance, and everything was the same. And um, if I do the plane wave beamforming, I get this dashed line here. Exactly like simulation, it's not helping at all. But if I use frequency difference beamforming, I get these two peaks. I should say that I'm beamforming the signal after the red, red line here, because we don't have enough information about the environment to know the exact arrival angle to make sure that frequency beamforming is working. But you see this noise pulse here? That's because of cable slapping. And by, we have the time difference of the arrivals at different channels. So we can calculate the arrival angle, which is we know it's at 25 degree. So if I beam from that, when I get a peak at 25 degree, it's for this pulse. I can say now that frequency beam forming is working in uh, experimental data. Now if I use synthetic time reversal for experimental data, uh, this was the original sound signal that was sent. This is a received signal. One of the received signal has only 48% correlation. Now I apply synthetic time reversal to these signals. I get 92% correlation. So it's a big improvement for the experimental data. Now if I want to conclude my talk, um, I show you that blind deconvolution with synthetic time reversal is, a, is possible when beamforming works. And uh, I show that uh, frequency difference beamforming can be used with a sparse receiving array to resolve the arrival angles when plane wave beamforming fails to do that. Um, now I just want to talk about a little bit about future work. Frequency difference beamforming is a new technique, at least in acoustics, it's very new. And I just applied frequency difference beamforming to a uniform linear array. But one research topic can be apply this technique to non-uniform linear array, like what we have in Kinect. Maybe uh, we can improve the beamforming output for that by using this technique. Or applying to non-linear array, like a spherical array. Also, I like to know the uh, number of microphones that we need for frequency difference beamforming to work. What if we have just few microphones, a couple of microphones? The other research topic is, are we able to remove side lobes in not very large the over lambda here when we are resolving the angles, but we get side lobes? Oops. I don't know what happened. There was a dodgy connection on the side, I think it might have just no, it, the, the presentation just went out. I don't know. Okay, anyway, so for, for not very large D over... <laughs> now it's logging off. Oh. I didn't have anything. I just wanted to say that not, for not very large D over lambda, how we can use frequency difference beam forming to remove the side lobes and how it... Uh, works better or worse compared to NVDR or other nonlinear beamforming techniques. And I uh, just wanted to thank my collaborators in this research study, Professor Dowling from University of Michigan and uh, Dr. Song from University of California at San Diego. And thank you all for your attention. I welcome any questions. I was wondering about that synthetic time of reversal. Um, so uh, could you remind me how that exactly depends on uh, the, the beamformer weights? We need the weight to be able to get the, the correction phase be linear in frequency, the extra term to be linear. Because if it's uh, not linear, then we get the phase distortion, right? So if we choose a uh, not, uh, not appropriate wave function, then we get phase distortion. That's why, that's why it depends on being forming. And then another question I had on that is, what happens when that magnitude, like that average magnitude that you do, um, has zeros or has very small values? Um, doesn't that transfer function estimate blow up when you have those zeros in the denominator? Well, we take the, the magnitude and then we square, right? 
So compared to, so if that, that case happens only if maybe for just one receiver, right? That, I don't know when that happens because we take the magnitude and then we square that. So it's going, it's adding the values, take right? the magnitude and square, then you average over, yeah. was it, you average over all channels? Over all channels, but we take the magnitude first. So it's not like having plus and minus to be canceled. Well, but, but that magnitude could be zero potentially, right? For then, uh, then each received signal has a small value too, right? So the, the top and bottom, they both are small. Um, I didn't... Oh, I see. Okay. You know what I mean? The, the ratio yeah, is going to okay. be... Yeah, I, I see. Going on from that, you know, the problem that usually comes up with, with room acoustics when you have a single source and a single receiver, if you were to take that channel and then plot it in as, as zeros on, uh, on a boat plot, in many cases those zeros lie outside the unit circle. And so if you wanted to um, completely remove those zeros by placing poles in that in the place, you, mm -hmm. you end up with a filter that is unstable. Um, and so there, there, there is no solution in that case mm -hmm. for the single channel case. If you have multiple observations <coughs> and those zeros don't lie in the same position, then you no longer have that uniqueness problem. You are absolutely mm -hmm. right, yeah. Um, for, for, I, mean, I studied this performance of synthetic time reversal for a number of receivers that I need in simulation. It shows that I need at least four or five um, hydrophones, depending on the situation, but I need more than one receiver to be able to recover source. And also, the, 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 in, in, again, in room acoustics, the, 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 the definition of how common two zeros is, is not a very clean, clear cut thing. If you have two zeros that are quite close to one another, mm -hmm. um, then what results is that the, the filters that you design have a very large white noise gain at, that, at those frequencies. So if you had uh, a, a microphone that had no self noise, then you'd be able to recover it perfectly. But then there are issues that when the microphone does have its own noise, you can't then start introducing very large amounts of gain at those frequencies. Um, and so that, that's a fundamental limitation that we usually come across. I understand. I missed at the beginning of your talk, but how easy will be to generalize if you have multiple sources? So currently what I heard and saw is one source and some kind of noise and reflections and in general what we call a reverberant environment. What if I have two separate sound sources? Two sources that are sending the same signal or totally different? Uncorrelated different Un signal. You and, and you are talking about synthetic time reversal, right? Bind decomposition technique. Then we need to remove two different phase sources. We need to probably need to separate signals. I mean, separate source first, and then I mean, we need to recover the source signal separately. I don't know. I didn't uh, work on multiple channels yet, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we can apply synthetic time reversal to multi-source sound sources, but. Uh, Maybe by finding a correct wave function, which has both sound, uh, both um, source phases and an extra linear uh, phase in linear in frequency, I should think about that. The other question is, okay, how robust is this approach to noise? To noise, mm. yeah, I studied that. For the a lab experiment that I showed you, I increased the level of noise. Well, it seems that working very well for the experiment that I showed you was we had 14 dB SNR, and I was able to go lower, like nine, eight. But so, uh, I mean, after that, we need to have. I studied that we need to have more receivers to be able to recover the source signal. At, for having at least 90% correlation. But it decreases, the performance decreases as a function of uh, if we have lower signal to noise ratio. So for the underwater acoustics, maybe correlation is a very good quality measure. But in audio, in acoustics, in the real environments, typically we use different measures. Have you ever tried to do a signal restoration and 
for a speech signal and try to use, let's say, PESC or some psychoacoustic uh, objective or subjective measures for quality. Uh, so instead of correlation, what measurement do you start Okay, if this is a human speech, mm -hmm. in general, there is a subjective or objective but psychoacoustic weighted perception of how good is I the see. quality, how understandable is this. There are various of uh, objective and subjective measurements. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to do this? Well, I, I don't see any limitation for that because it's not just for underwater acoustic. The experiment that I showed you was airborne experiment. So uh, it's a good research study. We should try that. I don't see any limitation. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't see limitations either. I just ask it have a tragedy. I no, I haven't. Thanks. I haven't. So in the experiments that you had, you had these these relatively narrow band shows. I think it was fourteen to seventeen kilohertz. You were saying for, for the, the for for the being forming for, for yeah for the, yes. for the underwater acoustics. Yeah. And your quality measure is 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 the correlation. What ultimately are you doing with these signals after you've done your light deconvolution? With the yeah, with the signal coming yeah. From once this. that's come back, what what's your use? What would you do with it? Well, uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, in, communi in underwater communication for submarines, for example, they send a signal. In the other submarine may receive a signal which is distorted, and they want to know what was the original message. So they are particularly looking for that signal coming from synthetic time reversal. What was the original message? After coming, you know, underwater is like a sound channel. We get reflections from the surface and bottom, and the signal recorded far, you know, the sound tra can travel very far underwater. So after a couple of kilometer underwater, the signal that we receive is distorted. We want to know what was the signal originally. So, it's, so, so it's, that that chirp is is a, a synthetic message. Exactly. So yeah. you're, you're just using that in place of some modulated yes. signal that they use to convey some, some information? Yes. For the second expert, for the underwater experiment, they sent M sequence, which was, it wasn't a chirp, it was mm -hmm. this M sequence signal. But the first one, the simulation, I just sent a chirp signal. Okay. So you, the M sequence you would ultimately use to estimate an impulse response? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're. You're using blind deconvolution to clean up a received signal from which you then apply an, another supervised system identification in the sense that if you're using M sequence, you know what the original was and what the received was. Yes. And that then gives you another estimate of the channel. Yes. It, yeah. The, the beauty of synthetic time reversal is, not, is that we can get the original signal and all the impulse responses at the same time. So we can. I mean, recover the impulse responses, we have inf then we have information about the environment. But there is, I mean, this is correct as long as the transfer function is not changing, it's constant. You know, if we have a long signal, sound, sound source signal, and we have wave, you know, the surface wave underwater, then the environment is changing constantly. But if we have a calm sea, then we can uh, use this technique even for the lo long uh, signal. I'm not sure I'm following the, the application. So you're sending a chirp or you're sending an M sequence, and then you're doing your very best to deconvolve it to the point yes. that you've got a high correlation between what you sent and what you received. Mm -hmm. Then there's no information in the. I mean, you, 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 you've got you, you you've already removed all of the reflections and the reverberation. Why would you send an M sequence if you're very if if the the very point of what you're doing is to remove the reflections? What? In, in the experiment, we already know the original signal, but, but in real world, we don't know the original signal. So the, the purpose of synthetic time reversal, find the original signal. You know what I mean? In experiment, we know that it's an M sequence with that specific criteria, but in real world, we just have receivers, we receive signal, we want to know what was the original okay. signal. So, you know? so your, if you use the M sequence, then the residual of the things that you weren't able to receive are the things that come. Is that what you're saying? Yes. You would send that as, as an evaluation criteria. Yes, for, uh, yeah, exactly. For okay. this technique, I need to have something to be able to say that it's working, right? So mm -hmm. for the experiments, I knew the original signal. But in, the, in the, the application of this research is when we do not know the original signal and we want to recover that.
Have you done any experiments with more non-stationary signals or like natural signals like marine mammal vocalizations? I, I, I applied this technique to marine mammals and they are moving, you are right, but the movement was not, I mean, we can assume it's movement is not uh, that much, that much big, so we assume it's a stationary. But if it's moving very fast, then we can assume that. And were you able to recover? Uh, yes. These, these pretty well? Yes, actually, an extension of that was um, lo ray localization. I did, I used synthetic time reversal to find a location of marine mammals underwater. That was a chapter of my PhD. You're, so if, if, if the purpose then is to, for, for localization, then beamforming need not necessarily come into it. I mean, if you have a, a pair of receivers and say, say you were able to, to work out the correlation between them, then you can uh, estimate the, the time delay of arrival. We can the estimate the time of, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. if you then introduce a third receiver, then you can estimate, again, the time difference of arrival. Mm -hmm. And then you can create a, a, a for, for every pair, you can create a, a, a locus of, of potential source locations. Mm -hmm. um, and that then isn't subject to aliasing problems. It doesn't matter how far apart you, you have those, those receivers. If, if your plan is only to localize the source as opposed to extract the source... Well, these are, you're right, but these are two different problems. We want to find a location or we want to find a source signal. Yeah. For finding the source signal, we need beamforming, right? But for finding the location, you're right, if we, I mean, we are not never in that range of D over lambda, right? Because frequency, wave frequency is always low, so we, are, we don't have that problem. The problem that I talked today was for the communication signal that are in high frequency. Mm. You know it's what I mean? So there are two. Just now that you're, you've used blind decomposition exactly. for the source localization are, case. It, it, it was an extension of that, so we need some other information too for localization. It's for, for recovering the source signal, we didn't, use, we didn't use any information about the environment. But for localization, we need some information. So it was another project, an extension of synthetic time reversal for social localization. But for recovering the signal, we just need to be informing to work. Thank you. Sure. Um, sorry, another question. Um, so when you do this frequency difference thing, um, so obviously there's you know, only finite frequencies in your Nyquist bandwidth that you can use. So uh, do you like wrap around? When no. You hit the, hit Nyquist. No, actually, that's the reason we need a broadband signal, mm -hmm. because when we are close to the end of the bandwidth, then we get we have zero after that. So we get, you know, for the delta f at the end of the bandwidth, we will have zero. So that's why we are losing information for that part. But since we have a broadband, we are okay. So is it the case that as delta f increases, you have less and less? Uh, cross multiplications between uh, frequencies? We have less or more? Uh, less. So like if, you're, you know, let's, if your Nyquist bandwidth is up to 2,000 and let's say that your delta F is 1,000 so you can go like you know, 1 and 1,000 or you know, 0 and 1,000 and then 1,000 and 2,000. Yes. But then if your delta F is 2,000 then you can only go like zero and two thousand, yeah. right? So you have less. It's not working in that case. Cross multiplications, but it's not working in that case. Oh. We, we are not able to resolve the angles. We need a bandwidth to take the average. Okay. So you, okay. So you just yeah. need sufficient bandwidth for yes. delta f. So that as you increase delta f, you just need a higher higher bandwidth. Yes. I see. Okay. Any other questions? So if you just had a source signal that was just a, a single spot frequency, then as soon as you go into that region of heavy spatial aliasing, then there's nothing you can do. You have to have some bandwidth. bandwidth you're right. to make that yes. And it's the fact that you're able to perform some degree of averaging yes. essentially means yeah. that... Because the main, the, the main part of that was taking average over frequency. If you have, if you have just one single frequency, then you have a problem. Thank you. Right, thank you, Sheila. Thanks. Thanks.